remote uh, is going to be Yuli. Um, so I'm immediately, immediately going to give the word to you, Yuli. Um, thank you so much for doing this in advance. Um, I know a lot of people are looking forward to your talk. Awesome, cool. All right, so let me directly switch to my slides. Can you see the slides? Yes. Awesome. All right, so today, as Quinton mentioned briefly, I'm going to talk about lazy loading. Uh, but we're not going to talk about lazy loading like in the classic sense, which you're probably used to already, which is route-based lazy loading, but more component-based lazy loading and how we can do that with Angular elements. And so let me first introduce who am I. So my name is uh, Joost Tumflona. I'm a Google developer expert in web technologies. Uh, I'm also a Cypress ambassador quite recently. I'm coming from Italy. Uh, there I'm working basically as a front-end architect at a company. And on the side, I'm also doing some front-end training and consulting. And I'm also an ACAD IO instructor. Now, these are some of my courses on ACAD. So ACAD has currently um, quite a big sale. Like they have minus 58% off, I think. And so if you're interested, it's definitely a good occasion basically to jump on and learn something about front-end development. All right, so let's get started with the talk. So basically, nowadays, when we have the modern web applications, like the modern single page applications, then most often we go to URL and what we see is actually exactly what you see right now. So some fancy loading indicators, maybe some text like loading app, and then we have to have to wait a couple of seconds and then the app boots up quite slowly, part by part. And so that's actually not what we really want, right? Because we want actually to have a fast experience, just as we usually have with a classic server-side rendered application. And what we want to optimize for here is basically for that startup speed. And startup speed can be measured in that so-called time to interactive. And that's basically the, the, the moment or the measurement, uh, how long it takes basically for a user to be able to start interacting with my application. So that I can enter some forms, click buttons, and the application will actually respond to what I'm doing. And so if you're curious about that one, um, Adi Osmani, which is a member of the Chrome team uh, and very and heavily invests into performance and that kind of stuff, he has written a blog post um, in 2018, and he has also updated the blog post in 2019. And it's basically about the cost of JavaScript. So what he basically says is that JavaScript has nowadays much a bigger cost, even if like compared to images. And so we should definitely start optimizing for that kind of um, JavaScript performance. And so basically what he tells us is we should definitely optimize for the JavaScript bundle. So we should keep them as small as possibly, of course, which will, first of all, improve our download speed, but it will also lower the memory pressure, like on a browser, on the, the client PC where the actual application runs because it's written basically in JavaScript. At the same time, also CPU costs will be reduced. Now, this might sound silly, but uh, especially on lower end devices, on mobile devices, this might be actually very important. And so what well, we should aim actually to reduce that initial bundle size, right? So we should keep this as small as possible. Now, if we take a look at Angular, especially uh, starting from version 8, we are actually quite lucky because in version 8, they actually introduced a couple of features which already by design help us improve that bundle size. And so one of them is performance budgets. And uh, performance budgets in general are simply like a threshold that you can specify. So you can basically configure somewhere telling that your initial bundle size, so the one that's important for startup time, should not exceed a certain limit. And in Angular, for instance, now starting with version 8 of the CLI, we can actually specify that budget in our Angular JSON. And so we can tell basically Angular should either throw a warning at a certain threshold or it should even fail the entire build. And now if you combine that, for instance, with a continuous integration server, that's actually really powerful because at each pull request or at each build you are performing, you can actually block the build and immediately get a feedback, oh, look, we included like a new external library and our bundle size suddenly jumped up to over the threshold which we specified. And so you can then start investigating and get some, some idea on how you could perform and basically optimize that. Now on this slide here, there are uh, a couple of links which you can check out how to do it basically with Angular CLI or about uh, budgets in general. Another thing that's very important is, for instance, differential loading. Differential loading means nothing else than basically that you 
ship different kind of bundles to your clients or to the browser based on the features the browser supports. Now in Angular, they have introduced that in Angular version eight as well. And here's uh, the slide here shows a screenshot from basically a chart from um, the ng-conf keynote presented by a Igor Minar. And for instance, on the Angular IO side, they were able basically to between seven and 20% to shave off the bundle size overall. And so what happens there is nothing else than the browser, like Angular CLI basically compiles our application twice, once targeted for ES5, so for all the browsers, which will need additional polyfills to be able to run our application, and one for ES2015 and onwards, which is basically for newer browsers. So we can, we don't have to include basically all those polyfills which are not needed, and therefore the bundle size gets a lot smaller. And then ultimately, of course, if you are not able to like already optimize application with these measures, we also have to apply laser loading. And as I mentioned initially, one of the main features or one of the probably most used features with laser loading together with Angular is the route-based laser loading because that's already built in, which is, is, is easy to use. And here you can see, for instance, a configuration. So in the drought here, instead of directly referencing the component and importing it and therefore including it in the bundle, we just use this kind of string, right? This is an, a dynamic import, which now this version eight is supported directly. So Webpack understands this before we had basically that magic string, which you see above. And so with that, Webpack already knows that it has to include about module in a separate JavaScript file. And then on the fly, when we navigate to that about route, Angular will actually call that file, download it, instantiate it, and then basically show it to the user. And in fact, this is what you will then see. Here, for instance, you see a screenshot and the network tools. And if we navigate to slash about, you see in the network tools, you will get another about, about module here, JavaScript file, which is exactly containing what we are showing in that about screen. Now, this is, <clears throat> this is actually quite easy and easy to achieve and is, as mentioned, built in. But often that is not enough. Because if you have a real world application, like a larger enterprise application, screens might be a much more complex. So for instance, here you see a classic layout, which you often have. You have basically on the side the navigation menu. And when you click on one of those menus, that route will obviously be lazy loaded. But then inside that data grid, for instance, we enter the detail of one of these. And then we may, might have here a couple of fields. I'm here scrolled at the very bottom of that page. And at the bottom of the page, we have additional tabs which include additionally, again, basically those grids, which could also be reached from the side menu. That's because in an enterprise app, people usually want basically to have as much content, as much context built on one screen as possible, right? Because they don't want to lose context. They want to be able to navigate to the same point from different places. And so here, if we now include those data grids, which you see below, which are components here, for instance, for that, um, attrezzi, which is basically an Italian word for place, for, for basically, yeah, place, which are maybe on a, in a garden or somewhere. They are also reachable from inside here, for instance. And so these are the same components which I want to reuse across my application, but I don't want to include them here in this bundle because otherwise it will be taken into that bundle. And again, I would end up with one giant bundle, uh, which will be loaded at the very startup phase. And so here, when I navigate the head, pop-ups might pop up basically with, again, other details built in. And so that might continue. And so lazy loading with routes might not be enough because I might not be able to basically get to what I need with those. And so what I want to take a look now is non-route components, so lazy loading of those components. So this, <clears throat> the smallest unit which we can lazy load right now in Angular is actually an ng-module, right? Now, there is this star because this changes with Ivy, and we will also briefly take a look at that. But right now, we are still stuck with that ng module. And so in order to lazy load such a module, because that's basically where I want to arrive at, like I want to lazy load a module where my component is inside, and so I can instantiate that component then dynamically. And so I could take basically simply by creating a, such a lower service, as in this case here, which takes uh, has a function, load module. And again, here you see I'm using the dynamic import function, right? Just as we have used in the router module. And so by passing that in, Webpack already knows now, which compiles basically our application behind the scenes, that this needs to end up in a different file. So the code splitting is already taken automatically by Webpack. Inside my loader service, 
I'm now getting that path inside, which is basically that function which you have just seen. I invoke it, which you see here just before. And then basically I get back a promise. That promise then uh, will be resolved once the basically Angular has fetched the JavaScript file, which happens by invoking that dynamic import function. And inside here then there is some logic based on whether I'm running on Ivy or View Engine, because these are the two rendering engines which we will have starting with Angular 9. And so inside here, there's some more logic, which you which you can read on that blog post there. It is not really relevant right now. What you get out of that is actually a module factory from which you can then instantiate the module dynamically. As you can see here, I am using the injector. I get a module reference back. And from there, I can get the instance. And then I can continue once I have that module instantiated. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned before, what I want is not actually the module, but the module is just a bridge for me, right? It's just a means to arrive to instantiating that component, which I want actually to get visible on my screen. And so dynamically instantiating components right now in Angular is actually not that easy. Like once you have it or once you have written it, it you can basically replicate it quite easily, but there's a lot of fluff involved, right? You have to use uh, like... Um, the, component instance, the component type, of course, itself, but then we have such a factory resolver, which gives us then an actual factory. And from that factory, you can then, by the view container, get actual component reference. So it's quite a cumbersome process if you take a look at that. <clears throat> now, once I have that instance, as you can see here, I can then go ahead, basically, and set the title or whatever input properties I have, because I can directly set them here programmatically because I have the instance in memory and input properties are nothing else than variables which I can access on the class object of the component, right? All right, but this is actually, this works and it's possible, but it would be much nicer if you could do it directly in the template, right? So directly have the component inside our template and it would just get loaded once it gets visible. <clears throat> and so what I use there, or what I usually have to use there is such a hook element, right? And to that hook element and then pass then a selector because by the selector I can then understand what kind of component I have to instantiate. And then that hook element will take care of basically taking the selector, looking up the module somewhere in kind of a registry, dynamically loading that module as we have just seen, and then instantiating the component and then inserting it right here where I have basically that hook element, right? And in fact, there are some libraries already out there, like the Hero Loader from Hero Devs or the NGX Loadable, which are quite popular libraries and they work quite well. And they all take that kind of approach. Like you have that hook component, you give it a module or a component name, and it will then instantiate whatever component you specify. But I was actually thinking, now this works nicely, but I was wondering, could, it, could we get even better? Like what I really wanted is, for instance, here you have um, basically a, a UI with these different kind of tabs as you have shown before in that real world application. And what I really want is that app ticket list component, for instance, I want to lazy load it, but I, I don't want to do much other stuff, but I would directly want to lazy load it here in my template without doing too much. And so actually, yeah, you shouldn't see really that it's lazy loaded, it should be quite transparent for you. <clears throat> and that's where, when I entered the Angular Elements route. Now, if you didn't start with Angular Elements, I have a small course there which gets you introduced on ACAD. But basically, what you do is you can use directly that ng add command, which is from the CLI, and you will install your Angular Elements into your project and set you up. Now, converting an existing component into an Angular Element is actually not that difficult. So what we need, first of all, is we need that create custom element, which we extract from the ang at Angular Elements package which we have just installed. And then usually in the module and the constructor where you have also access to the injector, which you can get via the dependency injection, you use that create custom element function and pass in the component which you want to wrap as an Angular element. So it's a custom element, right? And then once I have that, there's this custom elements API. This is a native browser API. And with that, I can register my component. I give it a tag name, which the browser then recognizes, and the actual instance of the object, the browser should then instantiate and visualize. And so what you can do with that now is you could actually compile it into a JavaScript file, and then you could just use that tag in any standalone application, so in any standalone HTML page. 
The only thing you need is the, the actual tag, of course. And then below, as you can see, I import a couple of polyfills which are needed and the actual ng elements JavaScript file, which contains the whole part that runs basically the Angular element. Now, this is the usual approach which is being taken. Like when you think about Angular elements, you always or most often people think about compiling them down to a JavaScript file and then basically publishing it somewhere and including them into non-Angular applications, for instance. But you can also actually use them within the same Angular applications. Like, like you don't have to compile them down into JavaScript file and then distribute it, but you could just use them, right? And so for instance, here, if you take a look uh, at that component, at that template of the component, you see that do greet, but you don't actually recognize whether this is now an Angular component or an Angular, like an Angular element, like a custom element, right? This is because Angular has really first-class support for Angular elements, for custom elements and that kind of standards. Because as you can see here, we can use the normal input binding, we can register to events, and it just works as we expect. The only requirement which you have is that we need to register that schemas here. Like we have to give Angular or tell Angular, look, that template in, or components inside that module might contain text which you don't recognize. And usually the Angular compiler compl um, basically complains about that. And that's actually uh, kind of a, a, garden, a safety net for yourself that you might have mistyped some, some tag. With that, you basically tell him to disable that check. Which is not optimal, but it's something we have to do right now. And so basically, with an Angular element, what you can do if you think is you register it first of all, right? Which you have seen before, like I've wrapped an existing component in such an element. I register it with the browser. And then I can just use it wherever I want. I can dynamically like construct the, the, the tag name and paste it into HTML and it will, work, it will work because it is the browser behind the scenes which then recognize the tag because we have registered it before and it instantiates the component for us. And so that's where an interesting part came to my mind because if you remember before, we want to actually do exactly that. So we want to dynamically load some JavaScript file which contains the component and then insert that tag directly into our template. So let me see. For instance, our lazy loading components API could look as follows. So normal usage with an Angular, within Angular could look like that. Like this is a normal Angular component. And then wrapped as an Angular element, I could just apply a directive, which in this case is that ngx lazy element, which is a library which I've created and which we'll take a look now. And that will then take care of the rest. So it wouldn't have to change anything else on my existing components, but to make them lazy load, I would just have to apply that directive. So how does that work? Well, first of all, I have the directive on the component tag, which in this case is my angular element, right? And I need that basically to extract or get access to the actual selector. And so once I have the selector, I can actually then go and look up a register, which we have to find to define somewhere. So basically we have to tell Angular somewhere, look, whenever you see that selector, as you can see in that register above, then go and load, by the load children, import that greeter module. Inside that greeter module then, I have the whole setup of the Angular element, right? So whenever that module gets lazily fetched by Angular instantiated, this code will be executed, so my do greet will actually be instantiated as an Angular element. And so what happens is that that do greet will now be recognized by the browser and he will simply instantiate it. And that way I have basically some kind of lazy loading, right? So let's have a look how the implementation of that actually works. So as we have seen just right now, we have first of all that registry. We need to somehow create a mapping between possible text which Angular might find on the page on within our components and what module it should load. And this is actually exactly the same structure as we have for the router. So we have the selector, which could be the path basically. And then we have that load children, which then has the dynamic import statement. Inside the modules, I actually, where I want to wrap basically my component as an Angular element, I created some kind of automatism as well because I don't want to repeat every time the whole wrapping into an Angular element, but rather I just expose what I need in order to be able to do that wrapping automatically. And so usually that is actually the type, the component here in this case, which I want to expose as an Angular element. And so then we come to the ngx lazy element directive, which actually closes the whole circle. So first of all, you see that star in front, and that star means this is basically a structural directive. So just as the ng if, 
that piece won't be shown until basically we decide. Like in the NGF, it's a Boolean condition. In this case, what we want to do is we want, don't want to actually insert the do read tag into the DOM until we have lazy loaded the, the module and instantiated the angular element and the whole component behind the scenes. And so therefore we have that lazy, uh, basically the structural directive. Now inside that lazy load directive, which you see here in the ONG on init, I grab now this template, which I get automatically when I have this structural directive, and I just render it in memory. And what this gives me is actually, it allows me to access this, the structure behind the scenes. So behind the scenes now I have a, a structure which I can navigate on. And one of the information I need is actually that selector because that selector is required to be able for me to look up that register and know what module I have to lazy load. And so once I have that, I can delegate everything to my component load, lazy load of service, whatever I want to call it. And inside there, basically, it will instantiate my module, lazy load it, and we will see that in a second. Have it registered as an Angular element. And then once I have done that, I can actually then render the template into the DOM. And at this point, the browser already knows basically what that tag stands for because we have registered it meanwhile. And so it will instantiate the component behind the scenes and show it to the user just as we want. Now, the final piece is the component loader service. This is actually very similar to what we have seen at the very beginning for lazy loading basically a module. And so it gets the tags, it looks that up in the registry, which he, he retrieves internally basically. Then with that, it loads the component via that dynamic import function. We have already seen that. Once I have that module instance, now with that module instance, I can actually go and look up that custom element component. So that property I have exposed from my module if you remember before, like as you see here uh, above. And then we can automate the whole registration of a custom element, right? Because now we have the component class, the component type which you want to wrap. We use that create custom element the injector. And with that, basically we register it then to the browser. And at this point, the browser knows when the attack comes along, then it will render it out. And so that's basically it. What we have now is basically just as what we wanted at the very beginning. So we have now our template and the only thing we need to change is to actually apply that NGX lazy element, right? And with that, it will wire up that lazy loading behind the scenes as we have just seen, and then lazy load my, my component here whenever I activate that tab, which means whenever that tab becomes visible, it will see that tag here and instantiate everything. All right, so let me show you very quickly how that actually looks like in code. If I'm able to switch my screens. Let me just remove that for us from the stream for a second. All right, do you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So, is it large enough? Zoom in a little bit. Like this? Yeah, yes. that's fine. Okay. So, we have here our demo application. And you can see here our component, right? That the ticket list with that NGX lazy element on top. Now, the ticket list is actually defined in that ticket module, which you usually have. Like, if I go to the tickets module, I have there here my ticket list, which is inside here. It's also exported because we could obviously in that template just use it as a normal Angular component. And what I do here already, as you can see, I use that custom element component to export it to the outside so that this ticket module can now be lazy loaded via the strategy which we have just seen in the slides. Now here is some particularity is that I can even export multiple components because maybe you just don't want to encapsulate each component separately in a module, but you want to have multiple ones exposed. So this is here a case where I'm actually doing that. Now, what I also need, of course, is that map, basically, that registry. And let me just navigate to the app component here, to the app module, sorry. And now you see here, I specify the selector, which will be the selector of my Angular element, so my custom element, and that load children, which points to that tickets module, which we have just seen. Now you might wonder about that dynamic element. This is just a prefix I'm given, I have given basically on my own. You could directly also use the app ticket list selector, which is the one the component already has. 
This is just a signal to other developers, basically, look, this is a dynamic element. So this will be an Angular element. And so they know basically, it's basically a, a standard naming convention, if you want, that this one will be loaded dynamically. Now, once we have done that, we are actually already set up. The only thing, of course, which I also have to do if I converted that from a normal plain Angular component to a laser loaded element is, of course, to remove every reference to that tickets module. Because otherwise, it would get pulled in again, and that basically would then prevent the lazy loading. But if you take a look here at the diff, what we have, what I have done here to convert it from a normal component is to, of course, remove here the element, the reference, as I've just explained. And then in the template itself, you can see how I basically change it from that app ticket list to the dynamic element ticket list. But as again, that was my choice basically of the naming. And I added, of course, also that ngx lazy element, which is a library which I have installed, which then takes care of the whole setup of lazy loading. And so now if you take a look here at the application beside, now if I go here to the users part, you see here below, this will be lazy loaded via the normal routing, right? This is the plain normal angular routing. Let me go into the details here. And if I clean here again, that part here on, this, on the network panel, if I click the assigned tickets, you can see that now that lazy loaded part will get fetched over the wire. It will laser load it behind the scenes and instantiate here my Angular element. And even if we go inside here, we should also see that this is an Angular element. Let me see what I'm able to grab here. The component. I guess I'm a bit too far outside. Map user detail, map tab group. Exactly. So here you see it, basically. You see the dynamic element, and you know that this is an Angular element when you see that ng version on top of it. That's something that Angular adds on top of it once you compile it as an Angular element. And so that's the basic usage of how that it works in practice. Let me switch back to the slides. All right, and so you can see this is, uh, I published this uh, directly online, so you can check out the library. Uh, meanwhile, it's uh, no more RC, so I have released a stable one. And on my blog, you can also see basically a video where I, I go more into the details of how this, this works behind the scenes and directly convert an existing application to use that kind of laser loading feature. Now, initially, I mentioned quickly something about Ivy. And as Igor Minar nicely said at Angular Connect this year, Ivy is an enabler. So right now, when Ivy gets released, initially, not much will happen. Like, they rewrote the rendering engine behind the scenes, but that opens up a lot of doors for new features. And one of them is actually also the lazy loading. Because, for instance, lazy loading of a component, especially, for instance, if you think about components which you have inside a dialog. In this case, for instance, you see a material dialog inside here where I'm getting a user detail component. Nowadays, if you have something like that, you always have to import user detail component into your file via TypeScript, and therefore you have a hard reference to it. As you can see here, I'm importing directly the component, so no more the module, but I can directly reference the component, import it, I get then basically that user detail class here, the type, which I can pass on to the dialog and it will dynamically instantiate it. So this is even way more easy to achieve than, I was, than what I was showing you right now. And so this was something that will be possible with the final version of Ivy. So to conclude, actually, that lazy loading level, which I've shown you at the component level, um, is basically much more easy. Like if you want to instantiate it in the old way, in the sense of dynamic instantiating component via the factories. Especially this is highly dynamic because as you have seen, once you have registered that tag, you could actually also go and register them dynamically. Like you could have a detail component mapped for every kind of entity which you have. And that obviously have to, has to map to some component. But you could dynamically create that tag name based on the entity name. So you could dynamically pass it into a dialog and it will instantiate that, that component, the corresponding one dynamically, fetch it over the wire lazily and just render it. Also, what's interesting here is it's template-based. As you have seen, we didn't do a lot in the code behind the scenes. So we just gave it basically that ngx lazy element tag inside our component. 
And moreover, we could basically continue to use that component just as we did before. So I didn't have to wire up some extra mechanism to, for instance, set the input properties or hook up to events of the component. But the normal input binding and event handling just works as Angular does usually on normal Angular components. The only downside, as mentioned, is that you have to use that custom element schema on the modules which use laser loaded components. And that is a bit of a downside because obviously you don't have that type checking mechanism which you usually have. And so thanks to these three guys, also to Quinton, because when I explored this library and went especially into the part where I parsed the, the template for the selector, they gave me some good uh, hints where to go and look for which root nodes to parse to see where the, where the selector actually is. So thanks to those guys. And finally, yeah, if you want to connect to me, I'm on Twitter. I'm on, uh, this is my website, ur.dev. There's also a blog post, which I mentioned before, which goes into a bit more details about how the, uh, the whole lazy loading works here. And I also publish, not weekly, but twice, like every other week, uh, tech news, which are basically about stuff which I mentioned here, for instance, like lazy loading or new features that are coming along with Angular and that kind of things. So thanks a lot for your attention. Strategy? Is that also something possible? You mean like an eager loading of these laser loaded modules? Um, I haven't implemented that yet, but that's definitely something that could be done because in the end, um, as I've shown the configuration, like that registry, which I called it, of the lo laser loaded components, is actually something that is already defined in your app module or somewhere. So we, by implementing basically a strategy, you could just iterate over them and invoke the function to lazy load it. So that would definitely be possible, yeah. Um, just using Angular elements not make the module quite heavy. I saw that when you clicked that uh, you pulled in like 43 kilobytes for just a module with two components in it. Yeah, the, the heaviness here, I guess, is more related to the material design which I've used, which is quite heavy, to be honest. No, what what's, what changes, of course, is that you need to have some more polyfills around. Like, again, depending on the browser, Angular Elements, in order that the custom elements work, you actually have to import Angular Elements library, which is from Angular itself. I didn't check how big that one is. But, of course, there are some polyfills you might need, for instance, for i11 or something. So there again, you have to balance because then, as you mentioned correctly, your bundle could again become bigger just because of those polyfills. But it really depends on what you're lazy loading and how big your entire application itself is. Okay. Anyone else? It's too late for questions. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay, then um, one big thank you again to you, Yuli, uh, for doing this. And, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And in case yeah, you can uh, just always reach out on Twitter and ask questions if you want, no problem. Thank you. So we're going to have some more beers here, and uh, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>